Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, another exciting episode of Thoughts on Your Shelf. And today, I'm hosting the most bankable host in Africa. He's a corporate MC, is theater and film director, writer, one of the most hardworking young people I know in this country. This is none other than Brian Aseli. <laughs> Brian Aseli is a firstborn. Um, my sole duty is to protect my family and provide for them. Um, not married yet, but then um, I'm one of those guys who would really just would like to make people feel safe and treated well. Like kindness is my biggest uh, tool of trade. I'm the laziest, most hardworking person in the world. My journey in radio is the difficult part of it. Uh, my journey on TV is the easiest part of it. My dad identified my talent in speech when I was about seven years old. I want to host the Grammys. I want to uh, be amongst the guys that uh, go to the Emmys. I want to be at the Oscars. Definitely want to die empty. That's why I, I put in a lot of work. Yeah. What time do you sleep? You do so many things. One thing for sure, I know when I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I know when I wake up. Yeah. Uh, sleeping is is a pattern that's dictated by my next day. Uh, so I have to be up by 3.30 or 4 in the morning. Uh, 4 a.m. in the morning. They say you set two alarms. Um, and I've said that one too many times. It's one the person that you are and the person that you want to be. The person that you want to be is 3.30. The person that I am, I would definitely wake up at 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the laziest, most hardworking person in the world because yeah. I work at night mostly. But I have a radio job that requires me to be up in the morning, like extremely early in the morning. So I sleep depending on what I have the next day. So it could be I'm from a theater show and I slept at around 12. I'll still be up by 4. Because my show starts at six in the morning, so yeah. You've been around for. I, I would. If, you, if sometimes when you say you've been around, it talks about years. But I don't think I want to talk about years. I want to talk about the experience, brand from Daystar, from Pal Radio, yeah. all the way to Youth Cafe, uh, Vibes Radio. Now you're having a breakfast show on on, on Nation. Nation. What is this thing that radio has kept in you going? Yo, uh, my my journey in radio is the difficult part of it. Uh, my journey on TV is the easiest part of it because I never wanted to be the face of anything. I, I didn't want to be in front of people. I always, always wanted to create. Uh, the passion started when I was pretty young. My dad identified my talent in speech when I was about seven years old. And I was not the best speaker. So I, I never spoke in class, really. I was you loud. kept quiet in class? I kept quiet in class because everyone else was speaking English. Everyone is just speaking English. I was in Lavington Primary then and I was really skeptical about speaking in front of people. Mm. But my dad was, um, there's a time we traveled to Ocha and my dad was really passionate about uh, getting to understand what do you want to become. So he gave me uh, Times Magazine. It was something that he collected over the years. So his boss, Mr. McKnight, would get a copy of Times Magazine. When he's done, alikuwa ya chakwa table. So my dad would pick that, would ask for the copies, and he would come home with them, Reader's Digest and stuff like that. So I started reading a lot of pop uh, magazines. I started reading a lot of current affairs. And he asked me to read it out loud. Uh, there was one, and there was, there was a time that I had my uncle's exercise book. Uh, so I started reading a lot of history and I started admiring very many great men uh, in history. So I remember... Where is your uncle's book? Why is it not on the shelf? Uh, it's it's an exercise book. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty much torn <laughs> by yeah, now. Yeah. It's it's pretty torn by now. But it was about American history and, and, and how they did, they actually did their, their politics. So my dad told me to read out loud. So I started at first, but I kept reading some more. Because I didn't know I, I had like a small problem. It's called dys dyslexia. Mm. It's not a problem really because I got the name dyslexia like when I'm grown and I'm doing my thing. Mm. But I would take longer period of uh, time reading compared to anyone else. That's why in my life I've, I haven't read a lot of books. But I, I, I love staying with the copies that I love mm. for a long period of time and repeating and rereading and applying them in my, in my life. Yeah. 
How do you describe your reading culture or what, 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 how do you define it? Uh, my reading culture is when I don't read, you will know. <laughs> you will definitely know. I stutter a lot. I, uh, my reading culture is the books that I read is the rhythm of my speech. So how I speak will tell you if this year this guy was really deep in, in, in uh, reading or deep in the books or he's just an to enjoy. It's in the choice of words. It's in the cadence of my speech. It's in the vocabulary that I use when I'm speaking. So I'm really fired up right now because you told me to prep. <laughs> okay. So uh, it, it, books really determine how I speak and how I write. So I don't write enough if I haven't read enough. So mm -hmm. I, I write a lot. Yeah. I'll throw you a supplementary. You know, the way yeah. those exams used to, you yeah. wake up in the morning and there's a white paper like, yeah. now guys, you had leakage. Yeah. So there is a supplementary. Yeah. So I'll do that before okay. the Let's end of the Let's go, let's <laughs> go. <laughs> but, but just one of the books, I think uh, that that uh, has struck me in your collection of, of, of books is this Bona Crime by Trevor Noah. Yeah. Tell us about Bona Crime. So I, I read this book by Pure Accident because I was one of those guys who it was out and everyone was really carrying it to coffee shops, to conversations. Have you read the new Trevor Noah book? And I was one of those guys who was like, I'm not going to read that book. So it was more like ridicule from one of my friends. Um, her name is Viv. And she was at the office and was like, I'll give you my copy just because I want you to read it. Because uh, there was an episode where he was, uh, not an episode, there was a, a, um, a chapter he was talking about Fufi, his dog, mm -hmm. and how he thought that the dog was dumb. And on, on talking about Fufi, one of my friends, Viv, was like, so Fufi did this and this and that. I was like, so Trevor assumed that his dog was dumb, but later on discovered that the dog was deaf. So like all these years, and I was like, okay, I don't know what Fufi is or who Fufi is. So is Fufi a guy or a girl? Or So she was really pissed and gave me a copy of her, uh, her book, Bona Crime. But later on, I got to realize that it's something that I really needed because uh, it talks about the descriptive nature of how we need to get to understand our fathers and sometimes our cultures. Because Trevor Noah was born in a period where it was all racial and apartheid is top shelf racism as he mm. describes it mm. uh, whereby the blacks were not meant to mingle with the uh, the whites and he was born of a culture where the dad is actually uh, Swiss German mm. and the mom was uh, Patricia uh, was definitely the, the blackest woman in Soweto <laughs> yeah. but such a rebel you know but it also taught me on how to carry passion uh, because he carried a passion that he had for telling stories. I feel like he's one of the greatest uh, storytellers of our time. And I st started studying him chapter by chapter, mm. getting to understand where he was born and why it's important to carry that culture of where you were born. Uh, everywhere I go, I don't talk about Kawangware, but definitely that's the hood that gives me an opportunity to interact with the men yeah. and women uh, yeah. that, that shaped me. Uh, off my mind, like in a Mama Omolo, Baba Omolo, they're the guys who are like calling me, Mtangasaji, Uko Haji. And mm. Maki, I'm like 14, 15 years old. And they would ask me what is happening in news. And I would tie it on to how Trevor grew up uh, in South Africa. Mm. And later on, he became the guy who held his passion up until he became one of the grand masters of interviewing. Is and there any link between Trevor is one of the best interviewers I watch personally. Yeah. I've yeah. watched The Daily Show for I don't know how long. Yeah. I can almost tell you. Oh, we, that episode, yeah. Yeah. And you also been, I think you, how many people do you, uh, roughly how many th people do you think you've interviewed to date? Uh, as of, <laughs> okay, I know as of. Okay. As of uh, 2019, mm -hmm. my brother and I did the math about 6,000 people. Yeah. Because there's a time in my show, um, Life and Style, I'd host 20 guests. And we would do every week 20 times the number of, of shows that I had in a month, 20 times 40. Uh, 20 times 4, that is 80 times 12. And I did that show for like two years. Minus that, there's Youth Cafe. Minus that, there's... Uh, uh, Pal Radio, where I was doing a, a show called Pal Overdrive. Mm. Uh, right now, 
adding on to morning fix on nation then it goes on and on and on yeah. minus the things that i do on the side uh uh interviewing guys in a panel so it's it's crazy i don't know it's a rough number probably 6000 wow yeah what's stuck or has stuck in your head about bona crime what what did you relate to with most the the hope that comes with the book the hope that things will will turn out better but it's also in the things that I, I hate it when people usually talk about their childhood and they talk about it as though it's so painful and it's something very shameful. Uh, when I talk about my childhood, I talk about it with a lot of pride because I know where I'm going. I know where I'm from and I know where I'm going. So Trevor pretty much talks of where he comes from with a lot of pride. And it gives me hope that Ukombele, by the way, it's going to look really nice. Mm. Uh, when people talk about where they grew up, oh, we grew up poor, we lacked food, we slept hungry. But I'm like, those are the ups and downs in the graph that makes the beauty. Mm. Those are the aesthetics that God has given you in your book. Imagine uh, having a s- smooth living. Like maybe you, you, you didn't know which color or vehicle to hop onto when you're going to school. You know, that's not interesting. Mm. But that's the canvas. That's the beauty. That's the graph that God has put in your book. So that your your your, the, your manuscript is so interesting that you can write your story in a very... It has the, the beauty of it. Mm. Yeah. So I feel like what I related most is where he came from and where he's going because I'd, I'd really like to rock on the global scale. Mm. This guy has literally given me a blueprint of what I want to do. I want to host the Grammys. I want to uh, be amongst the guys that uh, go to the Emmys. I want to be at the Oscars. Uh, when it comes to him seeing, I'd rather do three gigs a year, but not pay me beneath my worth. So it's something that I'm really adamant about when it comes to choices in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and not to be correct. He, I, I don't think that he works with a blueprint of being correct. Mm-hmm. He just wants to be authentic and honest. And that's what we receive in that amazing book. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about the parents or where he was born and the identity of his parents informs a lot who he is today. Yeah. Now we look at Aseli. What identity from the parents that determines who Aseli is today? I carry my mother's guts and I travel with my father's compassion. My dad is really compassionate. My dad is one of those guys who, okay, sawa sawa, we have two slices of bread, we are seven, how do we go about it? How do we make sure that we get to break bread together? He's an empath, 1000% empath. Um, And in most cases, I can feel people's pain, even when I'm not like in the space that you are. That's why I opted for a career that would help me tell stories and allow people to just have a mouthpiece. My mother's guts and instincts. I'm like, I'm ready to die any moment, you know? Uh, if I die today, I'm okay with the story that I've written so far. Mm. Uh, my mother's guts and instincts are a guide on how I choose friends, on how I choose um, to live my life. Uh, the fakeness of things does not really impress me. Uh, I want to be seen with Michael Black, because he is Michael Black. I want to be seen with Michael Black because we have something to share. Mm. We want to talk about. Um, I, I am, my mother's guts also guides me in that I'm not I'm not into FOMO. Like, fear of missing out. Mm. <laughs> At your guys are going for a party. Me and Danny, but I have to sleep. Yeah. So those those things are pretty much what guides me. And my, my, my dad's kindness, my mother's uh, um, uh, guts... Those two things, I think they really, really inform who I am today. Mm. Mm-hmm. And when when I relate that to now the creative aspects of what you do on a day to day basis, you're on radio, you're in theater, you're an MC. Mm-hmm. Have they re- have they inspired anything in what you do? Oh yeah, um, what I do is not who I am. Mm. Those are two different things. Yes, uh, who I am as a person is I'm 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 a loud mouth. Yet I'm laid back. Like I can, I'm really enclosed. When I'm in the open spaces, I'm really loud. Uh, when I'm when I need to take downtime, I really take downtime, and I get to enjoy it even more. Yeah. And it's something that I realized during COVID, that yo, like I, I really fall in love with the space, my personal space. 
So with the theaters and the TV and the emceeing, they they help with aspects of my life. They help uh, shape my presence uh, when I when I speak, my choice of words, you know, mm. understanding an audience, knowing what to say, and uh, how to invoke uh, an emotion or evoke an emotion. It it brings about my social life is very easy because of the things that I do uh, on radio, TV, and theater. But other than that. It just boosts my public speaking skills. Mm. Like I'm not afraid to touch on topics just because I'm avoiding any a, a, a reaction. So I'm one of those guys who doesn't like walking on eggshells. I like addressing <coughs> things. So yeah. everything that I do informs who I am to some extent, but it's not who I am is also sharpened by so many other things, other virtues and values as well. Yeah, mm. yeah. I asked that because uh, for me, I think. Where I, I grew up in a place that had no arts background. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember most of it was judged by, you're not serious. I remember the first time I, I, I spoke, there is a cousin of mine who was like my guardian. And I told him, ah, I, was, I was so excited. And I'm like, I want to be on TV. I want to record music. I want to come to Nairobi and uh -huh. do this music thing. And he was like, that is what is bringing you to Nairobi. Mm. You have serious. to be serious with life. Yeah, well, go serious. When they're, they're engineers. Yeah, <laughs> they are lawyers in their family. Yeah. They are teachers. They are... What are you saying? Mm. You just want to, you know. Yeah. So there is something about the background of the guardian, the parents, or the people who you live with who, that really either encourage or discourage. Yeah. Because I ended up here. Actually, I charted the path. Today, the, I, I always say I'm a pioneer in my family, mm. the entire extended family, because art was not really open and welcome because it was... The thing that you should not do. Mm -hmm. Soma, pata kazi, fanya kitu ya maana. Mm -hmm. But this was also associated with laziness. You just want to do drugs. You want to do... It's not serious. Yeah. It will take you nowhere. Took me a very long way yeah. to get here. And today when I look back... A lot of my uncles, my aunts, the, the people around us, most of them have opened up and kids are being encouraged. Do art, sing. Some of them, the first time they were seeing my music, I ended up recording and doing a video. They were like, and it's not bad. It's, the, it's, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I would really want to know from your side, from your experience, because before we start recording, you mentioned that your parents are creatives. They, yeah. they, they were in the music space. Your mom was in choir. Your dad was recording an album Yeah, when you were being born. Yeah. Uh, my, How did that inform? I come from a long line of we are talented, so that's not news. It's how you break the news. So <laughs> that's not news. Ati, you can sing. Yeah. And Sawa, my granddad was a uh, sharp tenor. Grandma was alto. Sawa, they sing. My dad was a script writer and uh, he did a lot of plays. And on writing plays, he decided, you know what, let me cast a bunch of people in church. And they were, at that time in Kawangware, he had just landed from, from Gashie. Uko, uba liko wa metoka Gashie. Sasa ndiyo, sasa mekuja, sasa hindi wa msi kusema, hindi wa naandika mnistari. But he also paid his school fees through singing. He would train people. And every time they were going for competition, the teacher was like, wacha tuwa kaya mtiani? Ndiyo, like it's going to be easy for him to stay in class and actually proceed on to the next grade. So that's my dad. Would write music helped him he came to nairobi and he decided you know what i'm going to write it but for church competitions and you know in those days church competitions are such a big deal and that's how my dad would write like a bunch of uh plays with music in it and one time he decided you know what i'm gonna do a maneno ya casting kidogo kidogo hivi nitafte sopranos altos nini kaona soprano flani ya meiva hapo yeye ni nani i decide are you soprano meni bamba i guy had to wait for like six years before eventually getting my mom's attention. So I'm um, um, a result of a choir master who decided ni soprano. <laughs> <laughs> na soprano akaamua ni huyu choir master. 
They sang me to life when when my uh, on on uh, before I was born. During the nine month period, my dad and mom were writing new music, Luya music. So I'm into Luya music in the deep kabisa, and they were recording their first album in Luya, and. I remember like a couple of months before it was released before I was born the music was we, the music and I were released almost the same time because mm. yeah so ni hesabu ama ni by accident because it was just during the almost the same period time, uh, period in time yeah we want that album yeah I, I hope I can get tapes there are songs I can sing off head from from the nini from the from the album you can speak luya I sing luya a lot I speak very embarrassing, Luya. How did that inform who you are? Because that informs the next book that I want to talk about. How does that inform who I am? I always wanted to figure out how my dad just came up with stories and nobody told them, told him about them. And I was like, and then he's telling people what to do. And these grown people are actually doing what my dad is saying. Um, when I was about six years, seven years, I was in my dad's choir and I developed interest with percussions the drums i played it in high school kidogo too and i really love drumming all the time i like drumming mm. so i was like watching what my dad would do with these teams and i was like i'd like to coordinate the way my dad does i didn't know it had a professional name called directing i didn't know that and when i was in high school is when i met uh former senator kakamega clofas malala is the guy who picked my name from a noise makers list. Mm. I was like, I think this guy has talent. Kuja, let's go waste time. It's not really wasting time. It's it's the reason as to why I travel the world actually, because of my confidence and what I built out of it. So, and then we started directing schools when we were in high school. So, I'm I'm in form two. Na mi pia ni kona kashule kangu apo. Mi na deski wangu tunandika play. Molimo anenda na yana wafundisha si tunakuja. When he gets paid, we get a little bit of pocket money. So <laughs> that's wow. the time making money when I was Tell in high school. Tell us about this Cleopas Malala story. Yeah. What what happened? What the Cleopas Malala story does not exist without OJ Mulwa. OJ Mulwa was my school patron uh, in drama. He mm-hmm. was the guy who was really serious about we were called the Vijana when you kitabu mekata for a long time. And it's just because we are gifted differently. I was very good at English, Swahili. Uh, literature was my thing. Math, not so much. Bio, uh, sometimes. Chem, so, up to date, I don't know I, wh- what I studied in chemistry. No offense to all the teachers. Yeah. And uh, so he met a producer called Indimuli Kahi, who so happens to have been, he's most recently retired from teaching mm. after 34 years. And the collab of those two people were like, how can we make sure that these boys feel safe in this school? How can we make sure that we don't have people dropping out? And they were like, okay, sports and arts. So in Viga High School, I got an opportunity to meet Mr. O.J. Mulwa. And now they started writing plays. But for long, they, they never had like a very good stage uh, director or script writer. So this 20-year-old comes to school. He had just written an item for, um, they call it items, like a script for... Mm. I, I think Mukumu girls at that time and they had mm. done a narrative and he came and he was trying to write plays and he came to our school. Very good story uh, writer. Plump came to our school and he decided, you know what, I'm going to choose a team. On the first time he chose a team, I was not there. But they created a pl- play called Faceless Faces and that production, up to date, if I get that script, I'm definitely recreating it because he did such a piece that changed how the village viewed the school. Because they're like, these Maragolis who are just speaking, I would like to speak to you in in, a, in an accent, Buana. You know, Buana. You know, in like everything that you say, you say Buana. Mm-hmm. In Maragolis, <laughs> like saying Buana. <laughs> so uh, when you say English, when you speak in English, and they're like, hey, you, you know, I'm going to class Buana. Yeah. So <laughs> all the time, <laughs> every time you start a speech, you're like, Buana, I'll beat you, Buana. Yeah. So it, it, it it's something that changed the village and how we viewed each other because this guy would write some tough English, you know? Louis say difficult English, dangerous English. That is what he wrote for us. And now it became culture for people to start um, 
adopting into a language that sounded a little bit foreign. Mm. It was not foreign completely. I'm not I'm not saying that the whole school everyone was speaking like that. Mm. But at least the culture around was sponsored by if you spoke like that it's okay because it's a culture, you mm. know. Mm. But now we started improving and we as young guys we were like what what's this Kakamega high school that people are talking about? Because Cleophas was like, ah, if you do it like this, you'll be like Kakamega High School. I'm like, who's this Kakamega? We're going to beat them all our lives in high school. Mm. And boy, we rocked for the four years that we were in school. Mm. We really, we beat them. There's no time they beat us uh, when it came to plays. They were better speakers, better director. But every time we appeared on stage, they knew that something, something is, they're going to lose something. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that's long story short, we formed a company called Next Level soon after high school with Cleophas, uh, Xavier Nato, Justin Nguyen. And then we just a bunch of creatives. And then this family of guys from high school, from Alliance, from St. George's, from Vihiga High School, gave rise to a bunch of directors who were now sent to high schools. And later on, it gave rise to new actors and now what we call Miller's Production. Mm. Yeah. So it's, And we'll talk about Millers. Yeah. The book that has attracted me is Directing Actors. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this one because it's Yeah. So Directing Actors is is a cost book. It's how to it doesn't teach you how not to. It teaches you how to. So my interest with that book is basically when watching actors do it then what are the right words to say? Mm. Now, when it comes to film, film is quite different from, from stage. Now, with stage, I can give you an instruction. I can demonstrate. With film, I'd like you to sit, perceive, and now project. Now, the difference between my background and where I would like to go is we were told what to do and we wouldn't question. But with this book, I wanted to just understand the mind of an actor. What are they feeling in that moment? How do I break it down into something called beats? Now with beats, there is, uh, you can't create a beat without subtexts. Context, what is the context? So I wanted to have the descriptive words of the environment of the actor. And then there's this beat that's the life of an actor. They pledge allegiance to it. And now the subtext, the immediate thing that they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to re uh, respond to it. And I was so moved by it. It's something that I carry and I, I, I flip on the pages all the time, just getting to understand how can I do it? But this time we're just telling an actor, this is what is expected of you, guiding them and not controlling them. Mm. That's what I'd like to do with actors. That's why this book doesn't actually leave my shelf. Mm. I'm like, you can lose it and then... <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I got from that yeah. because with actors people don't know or people outside don't know that any assignment given to an actor becomes their life for mm. some time mm. that's how you have to de-roll at times and, and de-characterize because your mind does not know when you're lying mm. it imitates everything your mind picks your acting and that story as your reality that's why we have method actors. The different styles. How do you know that this actor is a method actor? How do you guide them? And getting to understand that uh, these actors who get into a scene like this and they become that. Uh, for example, uh, one of my favorite actors, Daniel Day-Lewis, when he was playing Lincoln, it was one of the longest uh, productions. Even his wife had to call him Lincoln. Uh, that's a method actor. They assume the life of the character and what is required of them and the character Bible. There is people like Taraji P. Henson who snap off a scene like immediately. That's not their life. They know. Ah, me and my scene. Uh, uh, how I knew about it is uh, when I was studying Tyler Perry's work and he was talking about how Tyler Perry is, uh, 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 Taraji is crying on one scene and when they are done, she's like, eh, nani ameona Chris Zangu? Like, you know. Yeah. But with people like uh, Jim Carrey, who carry forth the, the character and they assume the role, they assume the life, not even the role, they assume the life of the of the, the assigned character, then it becomes hard for you to learn such people. Mm -hmm. You have to understand what to tell them, how to speak to them, and how to guide them into the greater purpose that is 
the entire production. Or rather telling the story. Yeah. yeah. So what has what would you say has been the biggest challenge for you directing actors? Emotions. Mm. Emotions. Emotions. And getting the bigger picture. Because you meet an actor today, uh you try you really see them portraying the character. You really feel like this is the right person because they were casted, they look like Sarafina, you know, they their height, they dance like Sarafina. Maybe uh, when you're doing something called um Soweto Burning with Spellcast Media, I got to understand that that there's someone who looks the part, feels the part, they're able to do it. But as soon as you start talking to them, and sometimes as a director, you become a little bit tough, especially in the Kenyan setting or African setting, we are, we are so used to, Nini umefanya? Like, what are you doing? Can you get your stuff together? And it becomes personal. Now, getting to help the actor understand that when we are in the, uh, this is the theater of the mind, you have to break from character to understand that I'm saying this because there is something that I've seen in you and I like it out. That's usually the toughest part. Yeah. But the best part of being a director is just seeing everything fall in place. It's like jigsaw fits to form a puzzle. Yeah. Mm. Talking about actors, you've you've also interviewed some of the biggest names on screen. I've, I've seen you you interview the likes of Jordan Peele, Kiki Palmer, Daniel Kaluuya, big players. Yeah. What what did you pick from these guys when you spoke to them? First of all, locally, John C. B. Okumu, uh, Bilal Mwaura, really captivating. Um, I got an opportunity to interview like a bunch of greats that I really admire. And the, 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 the kindness that comes with them, having been high achievers, and the kindness that comes with how they respond to your questions on air. And knowing that these guys have been to the highest level of a production that anyone would ask. Yo, blown away. Mm. I'm blown away by humility. I'm blown away by people who have it all, but then are treating you with utmost respect. And they actually want you to know and understand what they are saying and not who they are, not status quo. Like interviewing Jordan Peele was captivating because you'd ask him a question and he would actually take time to answer. It was a round table, virtual, guys from different countries, Brazil, US, UK, uh, Australia, because they were doing a promotion for the film Nope, mm. uh, where I also got a chance to interview Kiki Palmer and Daniel Kaluuya. Mm. It was just an artist asking an artist questions and their responses were honest. And I got to understand that there is the humanity of things that we forget as soon as taglines and as soon as titles come to play. So the humility that comes with it. I don't like the word humble because even the dictionary meaning of humble and humility are just you having to downplay yourself. Mm -hmm. But they're not downplaying themselves. They are just portraying humanity through how they answered questions. But I got to understand that everything is a process. Mm -hmm. They're human beings. They get nervous. They become afraid of what people are going to say about their art. I remember when asking that Jordan Peele on how he responds. Like, does he respond to, does he think about the audience when writing? And he was quiet for some time. And he was like, I've never thought of it like that, but I care. Sometimes I care when I'm writing. Uh, Daniel Kaluuya, same, uh, just giving him props on how the cross culture of him moving to the UK and how in Uganda people are also receiving him well. Kiki Palmer on how she's just been pushing uh, the narrative of being a black woman who's starting her own production company and just uh, informing people that where you come from is not a matter of weakness. It's not, you can become great. It doesn't matter what people are perceive their perception of you. It's in what that's, uh, what sticks inside you for the longest. The fire that stays with you for the longest is what is going to ignite the next uh, big thing. So I, just interacting with these amazing people taught me that everyone is work in progress. Even they don't know what they're going to become. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of your previous productions, the one you worked on recently, has had eight nominations on the Kenya Theatre Awards, Jaboya. Tell mm -hmm. us about Jaboya and 
and and what has it gotten you to mm-hmm. at this stage of your life Jaboy is captivating um nine nominations in didn't, didn't do it for the nominations for the Kenya Theatre Awards nominations. We did it because you're passionate about telling stories. I'm passionate about music. I did the music in there. Also big props to my youngest brother, Andrew, who did most of the music. Mm-hmm. But I just came to rubber stamp and say, okay, this one is nice. This one is good. But song choice and arrangements, he pretty much did that. But it was a concept that we got from uh, a guy called Emmanuel Chindia who is now credited as the writer, but I did most of the writing. Um, he came with a story. He's like, hey, bro, there's this story about... So at Miller's, they usually do rotational writing. It's mm-hmm. not one writer for life. It's this time around, we're going to give it to Michael, figure it out, mm-hmm. write something for us. Then you'll audition, then you'll cast and, and stuff like that. So one, one thing that really captivated me was um, they gave... Chindi an opportunity to write mm. and my brother, younger brother, Mike Ndeda to be the director. And at first everyone was like, mm, we don't think it's a good story. But it was a story set in Luoland, Homer Bay, where the culture is very simple. Fishing for a living. And then I don't have money. I'm a woman. I don't have money to give you the fisherman. So what do I do? I have something you don't have. So how about sex, you know? So that's what I have to offer. So are you in it? You're like, yeah, why not? Then now 500 other women are willing to do the same. The fisherman is like, okay, I'm getting sex at the end of the day. And that kind of trade and HIV and AIDS prevalence mm-hmm. is something that was really alarming and we felt like it was going to be really relatable. Mm-hmm. And so we broke bread together, decided to write and go on this journey it was crazy because Emmanuel Chindi had traveled to that side of of of, of uh, the lakeside, mm-hmm. and he saw it firsthand. And now we started uh, reviewing documentaries and going through newspaper um, articles and mm-hmm. getting to understand what's really the pain that's happening. But when we were writing it, we didn't want to portray the pain. Mm-hmm. We wanted to capture the day in day out life of these individuals who are innocently doing it. Mom, mom is doing it and we're getting fish, then we'll sell it in the market, so why not? But Jaboya was a story that went full circle. Mm. It was defying all odds where these women sat down. You know what? We've we've now realized that we can changisha. Whatever money we get from the market, we start a charmer. This charmer, we buy a boat. And that's exactly what they did. They started buying boats. And in the confusion of men in this uh, stance, the women were able to buy most of the boats and now they had to hire the men. Meaning we're not giving you sex, we're giving you employment and mm-hmm. we're telling you what to do. So that kind of empowerment is what we're looking at. And I, I come from a school of thought where there's patriarchy and matriarchy mm. where in Africa, I don't think it was a problem. Patriarchy, matriarchy, mom doing this, dad doing that, mom is in charge, dad is in charge of these mm. roles and how we describe them. It didn't come with the form of oppression that we see today. And that's why when we're writing Jaboya, we're not writing it from a feministic, we are feminists. Mm -mm -mm. It was just, we are society. And when this happens, it's the beauty of it all. It's like having a female boss. It takes nothing out of it. My my current boss, immediate line manager, is 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 a lady. Her immediate boss is a lady. My overall boss is a lady. And we are well guided. And it doesn't come with a lot of I'm not going to listen to what you're saying. No. It comes with let's do it together. You know, I come from a space where I feel like the agenda that's ongoing about feminism comes with a lot of traits that we need not carry as a society. Mm. I mean, women would not want a man to be their worst enemy. Why would you want a man to be your worst enemy? Because a man is three times, four times more strong physically than you. An 18-year-old compared to a 30-year-old. 30, 30 a 14-year-old compared to an 18-year-old woman. Even in terms of strength, they, men are more empowered. And that's why I usually say, how about we, be, we befriend each other? F- strike a balance. And, and, and most African countries, most African societies have found a way of striking balance. Mm. These are modern things. These are Tao things to do. 
I like, yeah. I like how your story ended and how you where you drove it because I remember in 2013 I did the same I did actually for me I did a documentary in Nyando now mm-hmm. uh in this side of Kisumu mm-hmm. and actually I followed those fishermen and and because for me I think the first time I had that thing it looks like a story like no that mm-hmm. can't be happening mm-hmm. and actually I went and found out and in fact most of those in fact there is a fisherman who said so what is the problem with that yeah and and because that's culture yes yeah. and it explained a lot why the HIV prevalence rates were higher. But now with time, people were spoken about HIV and I feel like today, the HIV is not spoken as as much as it's spoken about or mm-hmm. it used to be spoken about. And people seem to never really fear as it was. I read a report the other day that indicated that I think in the last year, young people aged between 16 and 24 had the highest HIV new infection rates, mm-hmm. and 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 I got myself questioning. And 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 you you've done shows that target especially young people. Let me say eighteen to thirty years. What is it in us that would speak to that stat that says younger people have the highest infection rate? Mm. How I see it from a Brian Asseli perspective is very different from how people see it academically and statistically. How does Brian see it? Uh, growing up, there was authority. A mom and dad, authority. A neighbor, authority. A neighbor would ask you, unenda wapi? Hautoki kwa nyumba? If you get out of that house, I'm going to tell your dad. There's the fear of God that we had as a society. As a society. So, right now, every other next billionaire is a billionaire because of a corrupt system. In that there's no authority. Parents are at work from morning till evening. You see your kid literally in a year, one hour a day actively for the year. It means that you're only spending about 365 hours with your kid. But multiply the rest of the percentage that is sleep, maybe for eight hours, and the rest of the 12 hours, how they break them down, times a year. It means that your child is actually being raised by forces that are not you. The agenda that's being set right now is the agenda of freedom. To me, it's an illusion. Freedom in that You're free to do whatever you want. Nobody should question. That is who you are. But culture should dictate who we are. For there to be a little bit of order. For us to identify as Africans. Because I feel like this African that I am today is a misinformed African. It's a script in Hollywood. This is how the African beats go, no? If you want to know how the African beats go, just go to your village. Your grandma, your great-grandma, there are those songs that you sing in your culture that are embarrassing. Those are our cultures. They have been broken down over the years. We are losing it over the years. And that's my biggest fear. So how people are behaving right now is an ecosystem that was created a while back. It's a wild agenda where women don't listen to their men, men don't listen to their women, men feel like it's okay, I can win in party ball, I love party a ball, and you know, it's such a thing to say, my baby mama, and guys sit in clubs and in spaces, and they're like, that's my baby mama, that's not something to be proudful of, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm speaking from my biasness as Brian Asseli, mm-hmm. Now we come to a space where your mother is telling you what to do. Don't do this. And you're like, Unaniambia kama nani. There's no authority. The church has been corrupt. Any other politician can buy speech from the church. Mm. Even our Pope. I'm of the better understanding that our Pope, as we know him, no offense to the Catholic Church, but that's just a front man. I feel there's someone who's running this whole agenda. I feel these individuals in the back scene who are just seated and they're like, this is the announcement that the Pope is going to make today. 
might as well read. Mm-hmm. And how that perception has changed is because I've been in mainstream media and some things come to us and we are like, we don't even question, we just publish. Mm-hmm. And it goes out to the public. There's one thing in the book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, it's right there. Mm-hmm. There's six, there's, I think there's six fears of a man. I think, uh, if you give me the copy, I'll definitely tell you uh, what, what we address. It's the six ghosts of fear. And that's what we are addressing right now. As, a, as, as we are growing up, you definitely feel these fears. Symptoms of fear of being ill in health. Mm. Fear of loss of love. Everyone wants to be loved here or there. There is also um, the fear of old age. And that's why they're selling this thing called YOLO. You only live once. Mm. If you don't do it when you're young, ah, you won't do it when you're... But then now, that perception of freedom. And then there's the fear of death. Now, growing up, we were sold for the fear of death because AIDS was packaged as death, death sentence, sentence yeah. in a tablet. Now, then came ARVs. They're like, ah, it is a part of AIDS, but to live longer. Now, what do people fear? Pregnancies, mm-hmm. but there's pills for that. So you find like these alternatives and answers to different things. And how fear has been packaged is how we operate as a human race. And remember, for everything that you fear, everything good is on the other side of fear. But sometimes uh, fear is packaged because it's a commodity. Mm-hmm. Because someone is also gaining off your fear. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm of the opinion that these numbers are going up because we, we lack authority mm. over ourselves. We don't have a conscience to, to tell us, don't you think that involving yourself with six, seven, eight, nine, ten people yeah. might lead to a risk of because right now you and I are in our thirties. Uh but there's a sixteen year old, fourteen year old who is in our WhatsApp group. Mm. They're gonna be invited for a funky. You're going to say yes because ah, see one end a sleepover. Whatever you and I were doing in sleepovers, if we ever attended sleepovers, is not what's being done right now. Mm. Not all, but some. Mm. Some there's free booze. Some there's codeine. Some there's just sex parties. You remember uh, Ifiki Wazazi? Mm. How long ago was that? Don't you think that these kids have reinvented ways of doing things without us knowing? So indulging in sex way too early lack of response, sexual health, uh, health responsibilities and leaving out the con- conversation completely, then that's why we have this surge in numbers. We are that generation of parents. I have two little girls. Mm-hmm. One five, one just under one. What's your greatest fear? My greatest fear <laughs> With is, them raising, yes, raising these beautiful girls. Is the kind of a father I can be to them. Because when... There, there are a lot of there are a lot of things that I would wish to avoid from my own childhood, but sometimes I don't want to say I was a bit rebellious, but I disagreed with very many things, <laughs> and and that landed me in trouble most of the time. Mm-hmm. Today, as a grown up, I see from a distance why I always feel like that message would have still been passed, but differently. Mm-hmm. And I think the manner with which the message was delivered elicited a certain reaction from me mm-hmm. that maybe if it was delivered differently, I would have looked at it differently. And that is what I always wish I can do. I wouldn't want to be the lion mm-hmm. in the home, but I want to be a friend but a tough friend who these kids can also know that, no, when you cross that line, now you cross that guy's path and it's not going to go down well. We're growing in a culture where the kids are so informed. There is information left, right, and center. There are people walking on the roads here with leaflets and that talk about freedom and and. The other time I was, last year, sometime last year, I had some people who were working with leaflets and giving primary school kids and telling them that you have your rights. Mm -hmm. Why are you telling? Mm -hmm. Okay. There is somebody else out there Mm -hmm. 
who is teaching your child something. And sometimes it's easier to look at it and say, as a parent, how much time are you spending with your child? But sometimes I feel it for this parent who the cost of life is so high. You have three, four, five children. You have to take care of them. You have to provide for them. You have you have to think about where they're going to settle, how are they going to go to school, and things like that. That has pushed so many people to very long working hours. Mm-hmm. And purely out of love, you want to fend for them. You want to take them to good schools. Our generation is trying to do things to our kids that our parents did not do to us. 100%. You see? Yeah. There are places where you look at it and you feel like, are we going too much? Are we are we allowing too much room for indiscipline? Especially, there are things that were non-negotiable. For me, I think growing up, my dad was called Saddam. Where we used to grow up, my dad was Saddam. <laughs> grew up in the area of, era of Saddam Hussein. And, yeah. And my dad, even the neighbors knew yeah. he was Saddam. Yeah. And my, my dad never tolerated some things in the house, you know? Like when someone walks into the room, um, Genya Kingia, you're supposed to be out of the room. Because yes. there's nothing to discuss. Nowadays, I see kids sitting with their parents. Wana changia, you know. My dad was yeah. not even Saddam only in the house. Yeah. My dad was Saddam outside even the house. <laughs> Is that dude, if you would find us in doing something wrong, yeah. he would not just pick his child. No. Mm-hmm. Everybody in that crew will get bust. And that's how we are raised as a community. We don't have that. But I think our generation of parents are the ones who've broken that. And it's my child. It's my space. It's my people. Yeah. But it's because we think that everything that came with our parents was associated with pain and struggle and not, not, not better. There are lessons from my dad and mom that I'll definitely pick. I will tell my child what to do. I'm sorry to say so. I'll tell them what to do. Mm. I will teach them how to do it. Mm. They don't have to like me, but they have to turn out well. And if they so happen not to turn out well, my part is something that I'm going to do. And right now, parents are really struggling because they want to be their best friends. Mm. I hear sons and daughters um, talk about their parents. This is my best friend in the world. Right now, I say that with a lot of conviction because I see, oh, so you are trying to help me avoid this. Yeah. You're helping me go through this stage. Unona. Because sometimes it's not all about avoidance because you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. And and also raising a child who has not gone through the mistakes to understand, hey, yo, this is something that you need to understand. Yeah. For example, uh, controlling your sexual desires. It's something that you can teach your children. You can but you don't teach your children by telling them what to do. You show them. Be there for their mother. Show them that this is this is my woman and I will take care of her. And gradually the kids will be like, if they're daughters, they'll be like, eh, nakuna venye dad anongele shanga mom. Even how you address them. How I call my girlfriend today is in the pet names that I had my parents calling each other. Like to me, there are words like darling or honey. I had them when I was too young. I was like, how come my mom is honey or darling? What is my mom's name? Then my mom's name is Jessica. I'm like, okay, fine. Jessica is called honey and darling. Let's see how that goes. Uh. And nowadays, for you to... And, and we've normalized pet names. Kila mtu squeeze ni babe. Babe. Sugar. Hey, sugar. Hey, babe. Honey. Which is okay. Because it's the culture. Yeah. But to me, those are names that I don't just call anyone. Yeah. Keep them sacred. Keep them, keep some cultures by your parents mm. sacred. Because you keep them for years, it becomes your family culture. There might be interference from outside. There might be choices that your kids will make. But just do your part. Because if you do your part and I do my part, we won't have incidences of what's going on right now we'll be having conversations on how our ladies will be telling outrightly the men, this is how I'd like you to treat me. Yeah. And it's not only going to be about money because women go where there is stability. It so happens that modern day, stability comes with you having money. Yeah. And that's how they feel protected and cared for. You know, 
So it, there's a lot that our kids are going to learn from us. And we should carry the culture of telling them, your grandpa taught me this. Mm. And it's okay. They're going to say, ah, so it was a kitambo, it was a grandpa, and we're not a sisi to... The, we'll always have that conversation. But how I pray that we get into a space where you and your daughter can really talk to each other even when she's 18. Mm. Even when you are tough. Yeah. And you're like, uh uh-uh, on your academics, I'm not going to compromise. Mm. On how you talk to me and how you address me, that's a you and I thing. Mm. This is how I would like to be addressed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, it goes it's, on and on and on. Yeah. And, on. Yeah. And, and and on this book, the Think and Grow Rich, uh, it's funny that uh, I've I've had a couple of people talk about this book, but most of the time people refer to it financially and they talk mm-hmm. about. It's funny that you you've you've looked at Fear. the other feeling <laughs> and, side of and it's and it's the last the chapter book. actually. It's the yes. last chapter. It talks about the uh, I think six types of fear. Six ghosts of fear. Ghosts of fear. Yes. Yes. And and those. Address those six things and I think your life will be all good. But there's a lot of things. Uh, sexual desire and how when you're mutating and you're choosing your partner. Uh, men don't know that women often choose them. They don't know. Yeah. Uh, women often choose who they're going to be with. It's natural selection. Even in the animal kingdom, women know this one will be the father of my children. Yeah. But this other one will be my husband. <laughs> <laughs> you know those can be two things. Eh? <laughs> yes, yes. It, but but you're lucky or you're blessed if you're the father and the husband. of her children and also the husband and also her provider and protector. That's deep. Yeah. So if women choose that, and why we feel like our women are not, we cannot control them now, mm. is because we've always wanted that form of control. We stopped concentrating on the important things. Of the six ghosts of fear, which one did you relate with the most and why? Of the six ghosts of fear, um, eh, okay, illness. Death, not really. I told you my, my dad is one of those people who would sit you around. He does that till date. When I was like 14, 15, I would feel so bad. Like when I leer where he would just gather us around and, and he would give us a hymn book, distribute the hymn book, or rather printed out pages, and he would sing for us his uh, the song that we will sing when he's dead. And to some people, would be like, your dad is so toxic. Your dad is so, you know, traumatizing the kids. No. He's telling you that there is a time where I won't be there. And as soon as you're born, you've signed up for that. It's just the when. So the 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 uh, the fear of death is something that has been removed off my life for quite some time. So illness is what I fear the most because it kills your capacity to perform at a hundred percent. And everything that I do, I want to do with my strength and might. So of the ghosts, I fear disease most. I fear illness. Me not being in full potential. Imagine have, having something like brain cancer. Or skin cancer. Something that eats you up so bad, you're dysfunctional. Imagine having dementia. All these things we've mastered, gone. That's my biggest fear. Mm. I used to have the fear of old age. But I'm like, we signed up for it as soon as we were born. You and I have aged together in this podcast. Mm. I'm glad we did that. (laughs) (laughs) We've just aged together in this podcast. Yes. And... With this time yeah. that we are having, we are in here, fixated in this moment. Yeah. And that's how I dealt with anxiety. Not living in future. It yeah. makes you rush towards the future so much, you're not at rest with now. Depression is basically you being in your past and wanting to dwell in the misery of what you would have done better. But you have now, fix now, and tomorrow will be okay. And, and that's the math, quick math. Life math. <laughs> and if you're listening to us or watching us, um, what's your ghost? What is what is that thing you fear most? Mm. What and and how are you handling it? Because it's not just about thinking about fear and remaining at that space of fear, but sometimes you have to face the fear 
What are you doing about it? Leave a comment. Tell us what you think. Tell us what are you worried about and what are you doing about it? But also, have you liked, have you subscribed? Leave a comment. Share this podcast with your friends. I'm seated with Brian Aseli, uh, one of the most hardworking young people I know. Thank you, man. And in theater, MC, radio host, TV host. Are you going back to TV anytime? Sorry. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm one guy who allows life to play itself out mm. sometimes. I was in theater for a long time. I stepped out for like six, seven years yeah. to just figure out TV and radio. And now I'm back uh, with TV. I'm now concentrating on radio. I don't know if I'm going to go back. Um, very soon you're going to be on my podcast. So I don't know tomorrow. Yeah. Today, I'm certainly sure. Okay. Yeah. One book I'd really, really, I wanted to save this for the very last bit because it's, it's, Something I would want to hear your thoughts about. How to Think Like is Steve Jobs by Daniel Smith. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this book. Now, I'm captivated by how the writer decided to break it down. Like, you'd read the first part of the book and he has given you the chronological order of the important things in Steve Jobs' career. Uh, he starts by when he was born. But he also talks about the years in, year out, of some of his challenges. Steve Jobs born. Uh, he starts this uh, Apple thing. Meets Wozniak, actually, who was one of the founders of, of, of Apple. They develop something in 76. It's out. They meet in 71, 76. It's um, uh, one of their first products is out. It's more like a personal computer, but it was huge. You and I were making fun of how the... the, the, the just to have space. Yes. I, IBM had to hire an entire room, room, you know, for that to be like, how many GB? I 512 MB. Yeah, 512 MB. Yes. For, for that kind of space. And then now we get into the mind of a creative who wanted to simplify everything. And uh, there's a part where he's described as the guy who kicked open the door uh, uh, and then brought the personal computers to our living rooms. Mm -hmm. He's one of the guys who's been described like that. That's Steve Jobs and how he met Wozniak. Later on, his involvement in Apple, how he was kicked out of Apple is something that I've learned that sometimes you meet someone like Wozniak, you build team. They get to a point, they tell you, you know what? This, I'm, I'm not, I'm not continuing with this. He sold his rights, left. It does not mean that that's the end of the journey. People will come in and out of your life, but have they served their purpose? Because mm. every person you meet is a teacher. What lesson did you get off them? That's one thing that people need to get to understand. That don't make, don't force people's permanence in your life. I don't know if, if permanence is a word. <laughs> is it a word? Yeah, don't force people's permanence in your life. Because sometimes you want them to live forever in your life, mm. but they're done with that chapter of life. Yeah. But one thing I'm most captivated about is the innovative mind of uh, Steve Jobs. The tech that came with the mind that he has. I mean, um, we haven't had an iPhone for more than 17 years. Mm. But look at what it does. Look at his involvement with Pixar that was, was later bought by Disney. Yeah. And how they won Oscars from scratch. Like Toy Story was the first ever... Toy Story was the first ever animated film. Mm. And it was a special category at at um, the Oscars. Later on, Finding Nemo. You see, those are inventions. Fast full animated film from a company a company that was actually being thrown away. Mm. He decided, you know what? This is what I'm gonna figure out. Him being kicked out of um, Apple yeah. and forming something called Next, and later on just figuring out that next is not the next big thing. His original idea was so big, he had to come back and reinvented even more. iPhone, iPad came. You know, that, those kinds of invention, just, I was really captivated by Steve Jobs' life mm -hmm. and how he equally died empty. By the time he was dying, he had so many things to release, but he had given the world everything. I mean, who takes your alarm, takes your uh, directory, takes your, you know, all these things, puts them in one thing. 
you know? And he makes it so sophisticated. Nowadays, we have a watch that's connected to your, to your phone that tells you you've walked 10 kilometers, an automated system that is now part of our lives. Do you know how many people panic when they don't have their phones on charge? Like, your phone is not charged. Yeah. It becomes like a drug, you know? <laughs> so it's like that high. We are I'm so not breathing. Yeah, it's like you're not breathing well. Simiongu got two percent. Yeah. I mean, with the minds of people like Steve Jobs, a person who would stay for hours without eating mm. and he would only take fruit so that he can stay in the office and work for hours. And now you're asking me why I'm a workaholic. <laughs> I mean, it's the things that we read. Yeah. So I'm, I'm mostly captivated by that. Just that's the long story, yeah. uh, long story about uh why I decided to read that book. Suffering through the book, and I'm seeing a comment here by Barack Obama where he's saying there, there may be no greater tribute to Steve's success than the fact that much of the world learned about his passing on a device he invented. And I'm talking about 35 million responses in real time. There's a guy whose death caused a whole... It was, it was crazy when, when, when he passed, you know? Yeah. And he passed, or I don't think Twitter Twitter was there, but the internet, people talked about it, really. And people like Barack Obama making a comment about the same gentleman who, in the spaces when it comes to revenue collections, I think as at, I, I think as of his passing, Apple was worth 376 billion. He went public and Apple was at one point, slightly above 1.78 billion mm. when he made his first announcement, when he broke the scale. And I'm looking at an individual who was in his mind most of the time, mm. spent a lot of time alone. We really do have the answers in us somewhere in there. Everything we're interacting with is someone's thought that was dared to action that invited someone who believed in it and they funded it. And now it's our reality. How I describe life sometimes is it's it's the alteration of thoughts. Mm. What you're meeting is just thoughts. But thoughts come as different forms of energy. What what's the oldest technology you can remember you've used you've 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 operated on? Did you ever make a phone call in one of these? Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> My nineties. I'm a very early nineties baby. Yeah, yeah. So I was born right before phones came out, <laughs> and my dad had a big, big Siemens phone. Yeah, like on a kidole. Yes, and I remember people would come to our house. Point you with it. Yeah. I, would, I remember my dad, uh, people would come to our house and my dad would be like, Sai, simu in a charge. <laughs> and people had to wait <laughs> for the phone to charge, you know? So that they use this phone. The oldest invention that I found really fascinated, I was fascinated by, yeah. was not even this mm. uh, telephone. L- a landline, we call it landline, right? Mm. Mine that I was fascinated by was Telegram. And how you would type on this side and the Mm. other guy is reading words and writing it down, transcribing it so that it becomes something, you know? Yeah. And time yake liko imeisha because there was these phones and stuff. Mm. But at my mom's office, there was a bunch of people who were still using it. I remember Apple 9899, fax machine was fax. the in. You remember fax machine? Yes. It was the it, where you type on this side, it's appearing on the other side. I don't know how it was done. But that was the most fascinating. Because I would sit in that office and just wait for a fax message to come in. I was like, yo. And then it would fall like a piece of paper on the floor and then someone would pick it would and pick say, it. Uh, Michael Black. Okay, do we have Michael Black here? Yes, this message is for Michael Black. When I say I'm to Flani Mekufa, it was really for bad news. Yeah. Or or yeah, for the long distances. So yeah, so it was that was the most fascinating that captured my attention. Yeah. Telegram and fax. For me, I think one of the oldest devices I used was a pain. Uh 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever used the diskette. Disket, no. Wait, or disket, 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 yes. Before one, CDs. Before CDs, before flash. Yes, before flash, before CDs. That yes. thing you used to save your CV on it. That's that's my dad. <laughs> and then he find in the evening he comes and then just meets us with the Kaleka <laughs> nylon. Yeah. He was just making videos of it. He would feel so bad. There are times you would put your documents in that thing and then the next time you go with it into a cyber cafe, it has nothing. You didn't save. And you start sweating and, yes. and, and you know you're going to a cyber cafe. Cognitively, I can't remember the diskette. I just remember the design. I can't remember using functionally using the it. The pain I had with the diskette, I can't forget <laughs> about it. I can draw it. <laughs> but now when you look at that, and today we've moved into a space of AI, what, what, what's your take on how far we've come and, and what are your fears? And especially when you look at AI and now you're talking about deepfake, we just came from a whole scandal with Taylor Swift and all those images mm-hmm. that uh, were all over the internet. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, the world is moving fast and I believe that artificial intelligence is not something that was packaged as a product for release. Uh, it was the one thing that was not launched. You know, an iPhone was launched. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Samsung is launched every other time. Apps are launched and we're given explainers. AI gradually came to us with the maps, the Google Maps, uh, where it would predict traffic. Mm. And the automation of things would definitely predict that this road might be having traffic here or there. Mm. But we used it as soft power, not as prompts. Now with the prompts, things like chat GPT is what is causing a big scare mm. uh, where someone can use a short period of time to custom make something that people have researched and built careers over. The AI that comes with, I can use Drake's voice to sing Malisa Fichito. Mm. You've seen someone doing a prompt like that, where we've seen, uh, you've not stepped in a studio, but you can use a prompt with your photo, with the description of who you are, just giving it a sample. You can create um, Michael in Johannesburg, and you definitely see the seaside of Johannesburg with the description. If you write in with birds in the background, it'll write, it'll, it'll do that, exactly that. It's in the creation of things that do not exist that people fear the most. Yeah, we'd had to, we had to travel to the UK for you to be standing in front of the Big Ben. But right now, it's just from a prompt. The things that we fear the most is data protection because people can use your image to recreate a whole advertisement without your presence. Mm. And AI replicates, uh, it it learns from itself. So with that kind of improvement, then nothing can stop it. When it comes to warfare and the automation of things, there, there, there are countries that are going to use weaponry on another level. We've seen drones going into a country, terrorizing individuals, dropping bombs by a prompt. You see? So those are things that are coming but are not regulated. Deep fakes are now being used in the States for campaign, smear attack on individuals. So um, I, I fear for one, there's no rules to it, to the game. If I arrest you today, there's no... Of course, people are studying and trying to assimilate mm-hmm. and say that if you do this, then you've breached this. But then there's no particular global outline on how you should handle AI. So ethically, I have not seen personally. Maybe you can educate me on the comment section and give me more context on that. So my biggest fear is that we are just about to get you to a reali- reality that does not exist. Mm-hmm. And it's going to come with a lot of threats to our personal data. And yeah, like when Kenya was hacked and all our information was leaked, imagine people utilizing that and forming fake accounts, fake IDs. Mm. That would change how we operate as a human race. So my fears are in that. Uh, some, Some people have... Systemic poverty is also something that's coming. What do you mean? We are poor by design. (laughs) Systemic poverty is coming. Um, the big bosses, the owners of things, our Kosawa, the guys who've had wealth 
for 300 400 years in their generation now cuz so they can pay someone they can own some of the inventions that are coming but you see when you need day in day out where well, there is full fledged cameras there is a ro- robot in studio that has been prompted to read news whether it's propaganda or not whether it's agenda setting or not our kids are getting used to watching robots and it's been humanized in movies in that now in our mind if you see unakumka samantha like even how we express our emotions to a doll and actually adopting it and making it more like a wife where our sexual desires will be fulfilled uh we're talking about um can't remember the the, the other one but it's more of you talk to it and so you like a puppy that you can send in a house for errands but you've programmed it and now it's being humanized i robot gave us a perspective on how such things are going to happen so there's a gender setting that comes with that but the systemic poverty comes when now we will be rendered useless services that we've been serving for years if we don't learn how to if we don't upskill and learn but ai is learning from itself so how best to deal with it so it's it's a conversation that's ongoing yeah there is a bunch of ai experts that i have had a conversation with we've talked at length projected our fears but we also see opportunity coming through the same bro say you need a prompt chat up with you can the best cv ever nobody will know if you ever stepped in class or not but it's going to be really perfect and you can write in different languages there's something you mentioned yeah. about deep fake especially with um, evidence and stuff and I'd want to hear that so i really want to prompt back and say with that advancement in ai and the depth it keeps going day in day out looking at the media art entertainment context the disinformation and misinformation that play a critical and vital uh, part in how a society relates with itself you in that media space what are your fears mm, i wouldn't call them fears but how to prepare my mind for mm. uh initially it was just outrightly fear and then i started seeing people in hollywood writers going on strike uh there was a pilot for an all ai film where a script created by ai with images that have created movement through ai are now creating a full fledged film through ai and i'm looking at the the schools academies and individuals who've been studying acting and imagine in the next 30 40 years that thing guys in hollywood are like i'm done paying actors i can use your image because you're famous and known across the world so i'm going to sell my rights for acting but that means that you sell your rights either one off or you're going to collect from it for the rest of your life without actually going to work now what happens to the middlemen who are providing these services what happens to the creatives you remember being a creative you're chosen I, i don't know if people know that being a creative is you're being chosen there's very few people that see the world from that imaginative side of things with science it's logic as is this one can count to that it's calculation it's formulas they exist but with creatives where will we definitely move to that's usually my biggest fear where now the world will be rendered useless in terms of skill so in in as much as we are upskilling then there's going to be one films that are created from ai and individuals and the kids you know there's a generation of kids who will be raised by AI, ai generated stuff so mm-hmm. we need to get into spaces where we now start understanding technology and how we can upskill in that we are the first people to utilize that as we grow older and also just get into a space where we can counter all these things deep fakes are being used as i've said in 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 
smear campaigns and misinformation. And that's my biggest fear. You know, there's a lot of information out there, mm-hmm. but not so many people know how to demystify if this is truth and this is just utter lies. So, yeah. Basically that. So I'm, I'm yet to read deep about AI. Mm. I need to learn a lot of things. But I'm a student of life, so I'm, I'm more than willing to get to learn more. Yeah. yeah. Brian, I think that conversation on AI is, is something that is still a mystery to so many people. And yeah. I think even the rest of the world, that sometimes when, 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 when we're back here at home, we almost feel like we are behind. I was at a, at a certain forum in, in, in Germany and the same, same concerns were being addressed. Was it released too early? Mm-hmm. And, and now it's like a cut mm-hmm. got out of the box and everybody's covering to either get it back or just manage it. The best part is it was released for all. You yes. know, for the first time, <laughs> chat was released. It was in Africa. It was in Europe. It was everywhere. Yes. It was an equalizer of sorts. Problem is now Africa doesn't have the kind of wellness financially mm. to compete and control the West and tell them that when we're making decisions, you know, they start with best quality, Uko, and then see, we receive whatever. Mm. And we chat and some other forms of AI. Yeah. We received it almost at the same time. So it levelized the playing ground, but then the utilization of it, then yeah. that comes to play where Africa becomes second class citizen. Yeah. For me, I think it needs to be guided by law. Mm-hmm. And I think in Kenya, for example, the task is with the communication authority. Mm-hmm. I've seen China, which are one of the biggest users of AI, mm-hmm. and Brazil, which is also considered among the first world countries. I've, I've, I've passed laws that are helping those countries manage mm-hmm. AI and I and I feel like sometimes those conversations we don't have them enough mm-hmm. here, and I'm glad that you've hosted a couple of people on your show who ha- are very hopeful that something good will eventually come mm-hmm. out of it. And I feel like there is nothing good that doesn't have a bad side. Yeah, but also maybe just to encourage our people is that let's get into it. Yeah, let's now. study it as early as now. Yes. As early as now, when everybody's yeah. trying to figure it out. Yeah, pick it. If ChatGPT is the only form of AI, you know, mm-hmm. get into it, understand the ins and outs, mm-hmm. get to understand how it works. But above everything else, I think Africa must participate in shaping the narrative. Mm-hmm. We must tell our stories. We might we must write enough mm-hmm. to ensure that our stories are out there. And yeah. I think that is the we must with we must. Which be custodians of our innovations. We must be custodians of our cultures. Uh, of course, Africa has emerging cultures, even the new African culture of feeling like we love ourselves more, like yeah. we want to go back to how it was back in the day. I'm looking at a situation whereby we have the opportunities at hand. Opportunity mm. is we can get to learn about it and utilize it. Fair playing ground, but it's already out. Yeah. So we can only manage it. We can't control it. It's already out. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and so the, these opportunities to managing it and utilizing it, the threat is now it could cause harm uh, or because there's nobody who has authority over artificial intelligence. Yeah. It's a tool for the masses, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think, Brian, you've spoken so fondly about, and I think I've liked how directly and indirectly your parents have really shaped the assembly that is seated with us here today. But mm-hmm. what is your favorite childhood memory? Ah, uh, man. It's a lot. Uh, I was the only child. <laughs> Sorry to my bros. You guys were not planned for your pure accidents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, best memory was my dad had a shop and on going to school we would i would sit on a crate so he would strap the crate it was uh for bread basically loaves of bread so he would deliver and then the last trip would be he would come carry me so i would sit inside 
And the best part was how I would just feel like that's the best ride to school ever. My dad had a shop. I knew we were extremely rich. I had zero biases of life. I was about five years old. I didn't care. My mom was the most beautiful woman on earth. My dad was the most, was the strongest guy on earth. He had money. I could, I could take milk at whatever time. I could eat bread at whatever time. So that's like the funnest memory. Like I, I felt, I felt really nice. I feel that at times, uh, even as a grown up, mm-hmm. when I have a little bit of money. Yeah. Not, not just money. When I'm in the company of family and friends, yes. Ali, also you spoke about reading and writing being a key component of who you are yeah. and, and how you look at it. Is there any book you wish you read when you were younger? Uh, if there's a Think and Grow Rich, yeah, I'll go back to that book again. Um, because the book that I wish I read when I was young, I read uh, Chinua Achebe as a Man of the People and how politics is being run in Africa and how the big man, the politician... And looking at the story of Mr. Odili, who was just a guy who decided, you know what, let me help the politician and see how he operates. I wish I, I would read it even more now, but the book that I wish I read earlier was Think and Grow Rich because it touches on the components of life. It doesn't grow old. It touches on the men who built America and the laws that came with that. And it just touches on all aspects of life that would control you as an individual to get to the level of genius that you've always assumed. Mm -hmm. So it gives you the resilience. It gives you like a manuscript. Some people are like, it's just a book, but it's for thinkers and for overthinkers as well. So if you get to grab that copy, you think that's the best thing that would actually ever happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. And the greatest man in Babylon. The greatest man in Babylon, something man in Babylon. Yeah, yeah. the richest man. The in richest Babylon. man in Babylon. Yes. Yeah, that like book as well. Tiny small, nice tiny small book. book. If you read it, <laughs> teaches you about the craze of the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for allowing us to sit with you here, man. The honor is all mine. <laughs> you know, like uh, I'm someone who's looked up to you um, for a number of years. I know. I, I remember I came here. I think the last time I was here is 2018, towards yeah. the end. Yeah. yeah, I met a couple of guys here, and they are doing. Great. <laughs> but it's it's such an honor to just see that uh you created space for some of us to come express yeah. uh even more. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. And I think Man, um you. me and you, I'm just trying to hold it there mm-hmm. because my next question can take us another hour. Yeah, 100%. and and I really appreciate having taken time to come and sit with us and yeah. my audience is also having an opportunity to interact with the most bankable host. Yeah. In Africa, Brian Aseli, check out what he does on Instagram. And and he has a morning show yeah. every weekday. Every weekday, Monday to Friday, Morning Fix with Mariam Bishar. Amazing show. Uh, it's bound to take over. Give us time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <Yeah. laughs> but of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a different approach to radio. Mm. It's not sensational radio yeah. of who slept with who. Mm. It's sensational uh, It's sensational in the, in the essence that it triggers your mind into thinking. So it's one thing that you need to listen. Once in your lifetime, you need to experience us. So mm. better join in. Yeah. Yeah. Check them out. What is what, what? How can we find you? How can somebody find At you? At Brian underscore Aseli, Brian underscore Aseli across all social media platforms. Yeah, that's that's how you can find me, or What's you can coming? or you can call me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, please call him. And um, this marks the very end of this podcast. And thank you so much for joining with us for this episode. And and remember, this this podcast is brought to you courtesy of the Kenya National Library Service, which is a national library service. Check them out. Look at K- KNLS. Mm-hmm. KNLS. Mm-hmm. AC.KE. The offices in Buruburu. Upper Hill, where is the main headquarters. They have a facility in Nakuru. And now, working to spread their wings across the country. I say this in every episode that that is one of the best places where you can sit and read and learn. They are custodian of knowledge in this country. But also, uh, Nuria Bookstore, which is the ultimate, where are you selling your books? Where are you buying your books? Check them out as nuria.com. They are nuriakenya.com. And um, the, 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 all the authors you want to try and you want to read from, especially local, they are on Nuria. 
Thank you so much for joining with me to the very end. Hope you've loved this whole conversation, but also we've thrown your way a lot of questions, a lot of comments. We expect to hear from you. Comment on the on the on the comment section, and also reach out. Feel free to reach out, and and if also you disagree with one of the things that we have said, or all us, of them, or all of them. Yeah, if you agree, disagree with all of them, even best. Yes, <laughs> yeah. and you want to know, but above everything else, what's your fear? What are you reading? What's on your shelf? This is Mike Mulure, your host with the most. Until next time, bye-bye.